นะฮะ I've often been told that The things that we say or do in the pulpit go in one ear and out the other, unless there's some sort of tie with something. And there are times when we grab at whatever straw we can. But one of the things that I'm grabbing at today is the word stone. So I've got one. Now, if I were a big, strong man, I'd have a big, big stone. You say you can't build the church on this. Well, that's true, but I'm going to come back to it anyway, because I think that's one of the things we need to think about. So you've got visual effects this morning. They, I gave you one more visual effect, and that's the title of the sermon. You're saying what? So somebody made a mistake. It's not Linda. Nope, I've said that. This is what it is. Can you figure out what it stands for? Well, I guess you could. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> well, you know, we get used to certain combinations of letters, and we all know what they mean. For instance, if I'd called it WWJD, you'd all know what that meant, right? Yes. What would Jesus do? Yeah, we've heard that so many times. Well, I've never heard anybody walk around and in prayer say I Y L M. In fact, it's a tongue twister to try to say it, so it probably won't work. But the first three words. Of of the scripture, the first four words of the scripture that Becky read as the first scripture today from John. What were they? Yeah, Becky can find. Yeah, Becky can find them right away. Uh huh. It starts out in that passage. If you love me. Keep that in the back of your mind, because if you love Jesus Christ, that's where our sermon's going today. It's sometimes difficult to know which translation to use. Uh, there are some people who don't like new translations, and so it's just fine if you would prefer to read it from the King James or from the NIV. But again. Uh, That Becky picked the message, and so did I, because there are some ways that the, uh, the passage is described for us that simply can't be explained any other way. Because the very almost at the beginning, welcome to the living stone. We're starting with this. Welcome to the living stone, the source of life. And that's about as. Dumb a statement as anybody can make a stone that's a source of life. Well, I think it's a pretty stone. I picked it up outside my door. We have uh, stone uh, decorations out front. I looked for one that might be appropriate for this. This is the prettiest one I found, and I thought, well, if we're going to have a living stone, don't we want that living stone to be beautiful? If you're thinking of somebody, if you know someone who is the living image of Christ, don't you want that person to be beautiful? Well, that's the prettiest one I could find. It's pink. All the others were gray or white, and here we have a nice pink stone. It's dirty. I didn't get it all cleaned up to show you. I started to, and then I thought, nope, this is the way we are. We've all got a little bit of dirt on us, Amen. so when we don't come in absolutely perfect, we may be kind of pretty underneath. What we're good for is maybe for decoration. That's sad. That's what we're doing: coming to church and decorating by sitting in the seats here. But in any case, I'll put this. Can you see from over there? Okay, so it'll be right where you can see it. So keep it in your mind as we're looking at this and look at what happened to that stone when it first came. Now, remember, many of the things that you read in Scripture are not to be taken exactly literally. We're not talking about a real stone. We're talking about what that stone really stands for, and you have to look at the Old Testament to know for sure. Because what happens is that God has made a covenant with man, 
And that is the living stone, the covenant that he has made, that he wants to have a relationship with you, with you, with you, every one of you. He wants a personal relationship with you. And that living relationship which God can have with you here and now, not way back 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or anything else, but today, right here in Fargo, he can have that relationship with you. And that's what the living stone is. Now, unfortunately, according to the way Peter's writing here, there was a source of life. That's Christ himself. The workman took one look and threw it out. Have you noticed how many people who have some understanding of Christianity have thrown it out? It interferes with their lifestyle if you have to follow it. One of the scriptures that was on the lectionary list gave us the uh, martyrdom of Stephen. Uh, and you say, what's that got to do with Mother's Day or what's it got to do with anything else? And one of the things is that Christianity is full of sacrifice. And that's what it has to do with it. The fact that we're not just accepting Christ and being something beautiful that's already a finished product. We may be just a bunch of junk like this. That's what we turn out to be many times. But you know what? Even pieces of junk have their value. I'm sure that Touchmark paid money for this stone, which I will put back. <laughs> but th the big thing is that they wanted something for decoration. And it looks pretty out there. It does make it nice to have around the outside of the patio. But this is not what... I didn't move there for that. That's not my source of excitement and life in where I'm living. So what is it that we are to be putting ourselves as building stones? Well, what is a building stone? It ought to be a little bigger than this, right? He said, I, I couldn't bring you a big one. I couldn't bring you, I could have brought you a brick, but you know, I think I'd rather be thought of as a stone than a brick. Uh, I don't know. What, what did uh, Jesus say to Peter? What did Peter do that made Peter call him a rock? Jesus, Peter, Peter understood what Jesus was talking about. And he said, I recognize that you are the Christ. You are the promised Messiah. Wow, that's a big statement. And Jesus says, yeah, Peter, you got it finally. You've got it. Well, we say finally, but of course Peter had a lot of trouble along the way. That's not, but that's the first thing. But on this confession of faith that you've just made, the understanding that God loves you so much that he came as a encased in flesh, lived the life of a person, and died as a sacrifice for your sin. That's what he's talking about. And Peter understood that finally. And Jesus says, it's on that confession that you've made that I'm going to build my church. It's fine. You've got to have some rocks. You've got to have some bricks. You've got to have... Uh, um, two by fours or whatever you have if you're building a building. But you've got to have something that is stable. We live here in the valley. It's a very interesting thing that happens here. We have a beautiful new building on the Moorhead State campus, a, a, a dormitory building for our students. And after it had been sitting there for a little while, guess what happened? You know what happened, don't you? It got a crack. It was taken down. It was going to fall down. Because we don't have stable land here. 20 feet down, it's still soft in much of the parts. So we need something that will stabilize before we can go up. And they've learned how to do that. Just how they do it, I don't know, because not everything in town is falling down, and some of them are pretty high. So apparently they've learned how. But they didn't know how when they did that big building over at Moorhead State. Uh, it's we need a foundation and the foundation for everything we do is this if you love me and what comes after that if you love me you'll keep my commandments and what are the commandments I, I love this because in the Old Testament we get ten commandments right and then the Pharisees do what with these commandments make more 
they make more commandments, more little rules. They've got rules. Some three is it three hundred six hundred and thirty? Is that it, the number? It's a whole bunch of them, huh? Six hundred thirteen. Six hundred thirteen. Okay, that's a that's a lot of rules, and you have trouble trying to keep and remember those rules. Well, what did the disciples ask Jesus? What? It's the most important of all the commandments and the rules that we have. And what was Jesus' answer? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with everything in you. You love him. And then he didn't wait to say, well, what's number two on this list? He said, and the second is like this. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I think that's the hardest commandment of all. You know, I can love God because God's perfect, and if I say I don't love God, then obviously I'm wrong. But I've got to love that neighbor. i got to love that person that let his dog come in to, and use my place as a... a well, I was trying to think of the proper word to use in church. But I don't want that dog in my yard. I'm mad at the neighbor who lets him come in. Uh, what about other people who do things to us that upset us and worry us? Uh, I have a friend who is so annoying that sometimes I can hardly wait till she leaves because she's so annoying. I still, I got to love her? Yes, I've got to love her. And I've got to love people who do wrong to me. And I've got to love people that I don't even know yet. And I can tell you that this came home to me one day when I was sitting here in this church. And a young person was sitting behind me. And during the prayer time, that young person was talking. And I was feeling so annoyed. And I was just ready to turn around and say something when I caught the words that that young person was saying. Can you guess what they were? And bless my family, too. He was praying out loud, and I was complaining. You see, we, have, we are so righteous and so holy, and we are so rock-like, and we are so small and insignificant, it doesn't matter anymore. Loving our neighbor as ourselves. This whole passage about the stones, if you have a Bible that has comments in it, it will tell you the places in Scripture to look up each of these passages. I'm setting a stone in Zion, a cornerstone. Well, it's in the place of honor, talking about Jesus who's coming. To those of you who trust him, you see, in the Old Testament, the stone was the people of Israel. He came to them and led them out of Egypt and made them into a nation. And then they blew it. Does that happen in our nations? And we sometimes have everything offered to us and we waste it, we throw it away. We need to ask ourselves where we do those things. And certainly the nation was punished 70 years, what is in the year of our Lord, 70. Jerusalem was destroyed. Not one stone was left on another in the temple. It was destroyed. Nothing came back till many, 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 many years later. This sort of thing can happen. It can happen here. Who are we, the ones who call ourselves Christian? How do we behave? Have we learned to love our neighbors when our neighbors are not kind to us, when they don't, we don't even like them? Well, but this whole thing, question, and when we translate from the Old Testament into the New, suddenly we're talking about the stone the workman threw out is now the chief foundation stone. The, the people in the Jewish nation threw out the embodiment of God, of Christ himself. They threw him out. They crucified him. The one that, but he is the foundation stone of the future. For the untrusting, it's a stone to trip over. How can you deal with this Jesus thing? Or a boulder that blocks the way. But he says, and I love the way it's said here in, in the message, you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, 
God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him to tell others of the night and day difference he made from you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. I wonder if you've been bothered, as I have been, about a television ad that shows a little girl about probably 12 years old or so, and she's sitting there looking very sad, and she said, I wish I was prettier. I wish I was smarter. Do we have any little girls like that or little boys in our community who want to try to fit in with the in crowd? They're not making it. They're not popular. They have standards. They've been taught at home, and suddenly they don't feel wanted at all. What have they got? Where can they turn? How many times can we tell a young girl how lovely she is, how smart a young man is, or the other way around? You know how, how, how smart the young girl is and how lovely that young man is. To see that our little boys grow into men. It's been fun to watch it in our church as they grow up. Where, what is it that gives them the courage? The courage is that little rock like this because you can't make a church out of one rock. You can't even make it out of the big one I would love to have brought in. <laughs> you can't even make it out of that. Instead, we have to have many of these put together. One of the things that's been interesting to me recently is to see some of the things they've discovered in Africa where they have found lost civilizations that had been grown, uh, covered over with dirt and sand and then trees and other things, but they found them. And many of them, they found walls, whole walls that were still standing that were put together without any kind of mortar. But they were put together in the right order, the right way, the right choosing of the rocks. And they made a wall that has stood for thousand years, two thousand years, we don't know, maybe ten thousand years. They've been there for a long time because they were together. They worked together. Not one stone. Who cares about one stone? Except that I stole this one and that one we'll put back. But the, the big thing, huh? I borrowed it. Thank you. That does sound better. But, yeah, all right. That sounds... Uh, I prefer to say that to say I stole it. Okay. But the big thing is what we need is not just one stone or two or ten, but we are in a process within our own church where we are seeking a new pastor. We're in a process where we are thinking about how do we reach out into the community. One of the pastors who came over to... Um, or touch mark in the past month. We have a, a worship service on Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. You want a strange hour for worship, that's it. But we have it. And this pastor was saying that they had done a big survey of young people and say, what are the things that you have learned in school? The top thing that they learned in school is you don't trust anybody who's over 40. Okay. Now, um, this is, they were checking on this, and this is a real survey. The second one is forget church. It has nothing to say to you. And now I forgot that one so appalled me. I don't know what the third one was. But the big thing is if the young people in our community think the church is a waste of time, something's wrong because the church is the rock built that is carrying our faith. It is our hope for eternity. It is our hope for reconciliation with God. You know, I hate to say it, but there's not a single one of us here who's perfect. We're not perfect creatures. And in many of the churches, one of the things that we pray each time we have services is we ask God's forgiveness for the things we've done that are wrong and the things that we've uh, didn't know that we were wrong to do, but we accidentally did them for all of these things that where we have made mistakes along the way. And we ask God, even if we didn't intend something bad, please forgive us for the things we did. And then there's one other side, forgive us for the things we didn't do. 
did you hear Jack's excitement when he said, uh, oh, was it you who was, or was it Scotty, who was saying that there were many more of you who came yesterday? The week before, three people came over and did a lot of work on the, on the lawn. Yesterday there were nine. We do better when we have more because we can make a big job into a small job. They could have done with more than nine, maybe. But what is it that we notice sometimes in our kitchen? We'll have one person back there, or one person who feels that she gets stuck with this job. How could we manage without someone who knows how to do things in our kitchen? You know, I could have done that maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, or 50 or 60 years ago, but I can't do it anymore. Well, you can laugh, but that's true. <laughs> And, and it's not going too far. I think we, could, we sometimes assume that a person can do things forever. But we don't have the church grow by having a few people who have done this forever and therefore they're the ones who do it. We experiment. We find out who can do what. We see the differences. I remember once, and I'm going to tell something kind of out of school here, I can remember once when some of the people who were going to be deacons in this church said, well, no, I'm not sure, because I couldn't pray out loud. And they said this so strongly. You know what? I've heard both of the ones that I heard say that pray out loud talking to God. Amen. I mean, we can learn to do things. We may feel it's past our comfort zone, but we need to be able to go past our comfort zone all the way to being willing to make sacrifices of ourselves if necessary. Isn't that a wonderful thought he's giving us? To be a, the priestly work, the priestly work is making sacrifices. And one of the main things we need to do is to sacrifice ourselves maybe a little bit somewhere. But we're called, chosen to be a holy people. Uh, we don't talk about being holy. Uh, we talk about being holier than thou, and that's a bad thing. No. But learning to be holy, to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that it just spills out. We can't stop it. It's there. We have love for the people around us. Look around in the congregation right now and look at somebody that you think maybe one day you didn't love so much. Where is that love? Can you spread it out? Can you go past what you can see on the surface? Can you know that the person you are seeing is a person for whom Christ died, just as he died for you? What an exciting thought it is. And we know that in order to do this, we don't do it all by ourselves. One of the books I was reading this week said, that was, was talking about a particular king uh, who bragged about the great wall around his city. And some people who came in looked around and they said, the wall? There's no wall here. Oh, yes, we have the greatest wall of all. Well, show me your wall. He pointed to his soldiers. And he, this huge army of soldiers, he said, this is our wall. You can't get past it. Well, that's not one soldier. If one person says, I don't like the way that the world is going, I'm going to war and fight it. One person can't do anything. An army of one is not an army. That's why we use, when we speak of an army, we mean many, 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 many people. Uh, many of the early Christians talked about becoming God's army. And in fact, Paul even has some of the illustrations of putting on the armor of God. Sometimes we need some extra armor, but the extra armor we get from our personal relationship to the God of the universe, the one who created heavens and earth, and he created it so that you could have a relationship with him. How about that? Is, is there a better message you can think of? That almighty God who could strike you dead any day if he wanted to loves you so much that he's given you the invitation to come to him, to talk with him, to share anything you have with him. And not only that, he has given you some of the people in this church, and maybe some people who aren't even in this church, who have helped you over hard times, 
Um, one of, and, and I, I could go on forever, and I won't, because that's the temptation. When we get into this, I have a whole page full of notes that I don't have time for, for this. That I think that one of the things we need to consider as we pray, as we work here in our church, is to say, who is my master? What is my master? What is the God of Fargo-Moorhead? What do I worship here? What are the biggest things? If you look in the paper and find out what is most important to the people of Fargo, I can assure you that it's not our churches. There was a whole booklet was put out on Fargo on everything that we've done. Not one single mention of one single church, and the booklet they put out was a half inch thick. How about that? And yet this is a place where there's a church on almost every corner somewhere. Not one was mentioned. We can see that for some people, the church is not the master in this community. But I've never seen a newspaper that doesn't have 50 reports of sports games. You'll find those. There's no question there. And now, even at the symphony orchestra, you can buy one at the intermission. Alcohol and sports have become the gods of Fargo-Moorhead. Both of these can be fine in moderation, they can in the right situations, but they've become something which has made it necessary. Our young people are being swamped with all kinds of alcohol and drugs. And you know, this is not a new problem. And I'm preaching at you. Yeah. <laughs> It's not a new problem. When we came here in 1962, something came up, and I can remember that our pastor in First Baptist Church made a comment in church that at least we didn't have to worry about drugs in Fargo. And his daughter came to me afterwards. She says, you know, I've tried to tell him, but I can tell you where you can buy drugs in Fargo. And that was in 1962 or three. It's not a new problem. It's been here. It's just gotten worse. And now, if you can't have a pill for this and a pill for that, I went out and bought Blue Emu because we're all drug addicts one way or another. Incidentally, I don't think it works very well. <laughs> I tried it too. You tried it too. I should have talked to you earlier. Well, it didn't hurt anything, and I think maybe it helps a little. But it didn't do the job they advertise. But what are, it's not a, an emotional problem. It's arthritis in my hands. So, <laughs> so it's, it's not something. Huh? Yeah. Clarify that for them. Yes, because I think that's something that uh, we need to think about. And we need to think about it a lot. And we need to be concerned about our young people feeling so inadequate that life is so impossible that we've got to cover it up with something. Let's blur it out there somewhere. I'll feel better if I don't have to deal with life. That's not knowing the stone. Even a little stone knows more than that. What can we do? How can we get together and get all of us little stones together and be strong enough to build a wall, strong enough to build a building, strong enough to help people find the Christ who has died for us? But he didn't just die for us. He's alive. And I keep using the pastor's word he made up, and I love it, because when you hear the word, it, you know it's strange, but it makes you think about it. Instead of talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit, he talked about the hearness. Hearness. There's no such word, but you know, you figure what it is. He's here, right here, in this room. We don't have to go out somewhere or buy a pig and sacrifice it. Well, that's the wrong animal, isn't it? Okay, whatever the animal. We don't have to worry about that. Now, what we need to do is to give our hearts to him. And when he is standing there, you know, you hear a lot of things about um, Brazil. 
we had the Olympics there recently, and it was kind of uh, fun to see the things that they mentioned. But when I stopped there as a stop on a, on a tour, we went up to the Christ figure on top of the mountain. Um, there are two things about it that really stood out for me, and that is that in English, little kids everywhere have, would say, have you been to Christ Redeemer? Have you seen Christ Redeemer? They put the words together, Christ Redeemer. They don't just say the picture of Jesus or, or the statue of Jesus. It's huge. It's much taller than this room. And he's standing there like this in the shape of the cross, but his hands are out. Come to me, come to me. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of imagery I've ever seen, that Christ is standing there saying, come to me, even in the midst of all the ugliness that goes on in Rio. But this is a beautiful thing that he's there, and he's right there just outside your vision saying, come to me, come to me, I love you. I want to enfold you. I want you to be mine. I want to, you to love me because I love you. We thank you, Father, that you love us so much that you were willing to die for us. We thank you, Father, that you are with us today, just as you were with the disciples and the young Christians who took your word across the known world. We thank you for all of those things, Father, but that doesn't take away from our responsibility. And Father, we want to choose you as our master. We don't want these things that are so popular in our culture to be our master. Will that make us more popular? Will it make us rich? No, Father, we're not looking for that. What we want is that wonderful gift to have that communion with you to know that we can be in communion with you, go straight to you. We thank you for that, Father. Be with us here in this room right now and guide us Amen. as we sing, as we pray, as we go out into our homes, knowing that a rock, one little rock, that's all we are. But together, Father, we know we can build the kingdom for you. Bless us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.